Um, we've got, uh, I think everybody pretty much knows Bob Slavsky. Uh, he's a uh, member of our chapter, uh, retired from United Airlines. And he's going to talk a little bit first about uh, what he, uh, the flying he did in Alaska before he got hired by, by United. Uh, Oh, there's that picture. Yeah. yeah. The only picture I have. <laughs> His wife brought a picture that was up on their wall to pass around and let you see what he looked like uh, way back then. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was uh, that right air service. That's a, a chieftain. A chieftain. chieftain. And that's Valdez. Yeah, yeah we'll pass that around if you want. Shake. Shake. And he's got his dog. Uh, Three, yeah. three year old lab Shake. named Moose. Shake. <laughs> Shake. Niner. Shake hands. Shake. Shake hands. Come on. Come on. Shake. Niner. Shake. Well, we got now. We'll let Bob get started then and uh, Shake. take it away. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. Moose. Moose. Shake. <laughs> Well, again, uh, just like Russ, uh, Don said, my name's Bob Litch and do a lot of uh, Young Eagle flights and that sort of thing. And <clears throat> I lived in Alaska for 12 years altogether from 1966 to 78. And uh, for half of that time I was flying commercially and the other half was uh, going uh, to school at the University of Alaska. And so <clears throat> when I graduated, you might wonder how, uh, I'm, I'm from Santa Monica. And uh, so how did a nice kid from Santa Monica end up in Alaska? So the way it happened, and this is true, it won't sound right, but I decided to take a camping trip after I got out of uh, high school and I had saved, I used to do a lot of house painting and I'd saved uh, some money. And so I, uh, this was in the last week of August and it was, I only had two weeks before my first year of college start. And uh, so, I uh, loaded up my old Plymouth station wagon, and uh, my intention was to uh, go on up uh, through uh, Oregon, California and Oregon, and up to Washington, and then uh, through uh, Idaho and uh, Montana, back through uh, Wyoming, through Colorado, and uh, then uh, into uh, New Mexico, up a little bit into uh, Utah, and uh, then on down through Arizona, and end up back in Santa Monica about uh, two weeks later. So I started the trip and uh, all camping and uh, went through, up through Oregon and ended up in uh, uh, somewhere in Washington. I'm not exactly sure, but there was a uh, kind of a tourist uh, place that had a lot of maps and information. And so I stopped there and I noticed a, a young girl, a little blonde with a ponytail, and she uh, got out of a car, this little Volkswagen and uh, headed over to the building where all the maps and things were. And I looked at the car, and it had Alaska plates on it. And at that time, I thought Alaska was just all, you know, wilderness, just, you know, no roads, just tundra and ice and snow. And I got to thinking, now, how, how could somebody have a Volkswagen in Alaska? And right then and there, I decided I'm going to Alaska. I just want to find out what it's like. And so I abandoned my whole trip that I had planned, and uh, I found some maps on Alaska and uh, headed up to Alaska. I, uh, some of you that have traveled there before, I basically went up through uh, Prince George and into Dawson Creek at the beginning of the Alaska Highway. And it's about 1,500 miles up to Fairbanks. And uh, the only thing my dad told me, uh, he wasn't real happy about this trip and he was a little worried about it. And so I said, well, I'll send you a postcard every day. So, and I told him my plan, you know, to go through all the states. And then pretty soon he was getting postcards from uh, British Columbia and then, uh, you know, further and further up. And uh, so I sent him one from Fairbanks and I was just about broke at that point. And I, I was figuring my money really close and <clears throat> thought I'd have uh, enough money to get home. Well, uh, towards the end of the trip, I ended up in Medford, Oregon. And we have uh, relatives there uh, Maxine Anderson was her name, and I was out of money. I had, I didn't have any money for gas or food to get any further than Medford. So I show up at her front door and I said, "Do you need a lawn mowed?" And she, she said, "Oh, sure, you know," because she had seen me as a young kid and many a time when we visited up there. So 
I did some yard work for her and she kind of knew what was going on and I was flat out broke and needed to get back to LA so she gave me just enough money for you know doing the work I did to get back to LA and uh, so basically I, that sold me on Alaska I just just absolutely fell in love with Alaska and thought this is where I want to live so <clears throat> then uh, my dad had ALS and uh, he died a few few months later and uh, my mom was having a hard time with it so instead of going up to Alaska right away I decided to uh, you know stay in California a little bit longer so I went to the first two years of college at uh, in Santa Monica and uh, <clears throat> then I uh, headed up to go to school in uh, at the University of Alaska in uh, 1966 and <clears throat> so I went up there and I spent three years in uh, electrical engineering graduated out of electrical engineering and uh, at the end of the school year I found out that uh, you know they were building a new highway between uh, Fairbanks and Anchorage the old highway was built years ago way in the early 1900s but the new one goes right by Mount McKinley well in Denali now but at that time it was Mount McKinley and uh, so we found out that if I just took this little three-day short course in surveying that you could get a job with the highway department so I did that I took the three-day course and got hired by the uh, state of Alaska and uh, we lived in a place called Talkeetna and uh, it was pretty good money for you know those days about four dollars an hour which is way good back in 1969 mm -hmm. and so I I, uh, we had one day off a, a month and so, or I mean a, a week. So uh, I went to a place called Palmer and there was this little Luscombe there and it had a for sale sign on it. And I, it was $2,500 for this Luscombe 8A. And so I bought it and it was, it was in pretty bad shape. It, it uh, you know, it, it claimed he was restoring it, but uh, not knowing very much about airplanes that, you know, that far back, I had probably a hundred hours total flying time. And, so I bought this little Luscombe, and uh, one of the first flights I took uh, was uh, back to Talkeetna. There's a little uh, strip there. Uh, the, it's called Talkeetna Village Strip, and one of the most famous pilots in Alaska had his uh, operation there. It was Don Sheldon, the famous mountain pilot. And so I had a friend with me, and the strip was only about 1,000 feet long. And so we landed with a slight tailwind. And the Luscombe has heel brakes. And I'd only flown this airplane maybe three hours, and I'm still trying to get used to the heel brakes. I can't find a darn thing. So we're going down this runway, and uh, you know it's not slowing down very fast because I had a pretty heavy guy with me. And I'm, finally, I got the heel brakes about halfway down the runway, and Don Sheldon's hangar is right in front of us there. At the very end, I found it, and I kicked the brake, and I kind of you know just turned right around in front of his hangar and he heard uh, you know the airplane coming up and so he came out and said well it's got a pretty paint job and so he, he was uh, one of the most famous pilots in Alaska and he uh, flew all the uh, you know hikers up to Mount McKinley and uh, so uh, then at the end of the this job that I had surveying I decided well I'll just go down and visit my mom and dad so or not my dad he was all passed along but visit my mom so climbed into Luscombe and flew uh, seven days, 50 flying hours, and 33 fuel stops. Luscombe 8A has a 14 gallon tank, and so your range is about 200 miles. And so then I, uh, after that, I, I went down and met an old friend that I learned to fly with when I was 16 years old, back around 1962 or so, and he said, hey, we, I know about this glider field, let's go out and take a look at it. So we hopped in my Luscombe and uh, uh, it's called Pear Blossom, if anybody knows where that is. There's, uh, you know, Palmdale and uh, Apple Valley, and it's all in that area on the east side of the San Gabriel Mountains. And uh, so I landed there with my friend, and we started looking around, and this, uh, you know, guy came up and looking at my airplane, and he said, uh, where are you guys from? And I said, well, I, I came down from uh, Alaska, just here for a visit. And he says, well, do you have a commercial license? And I said, yeah. So he said, how would you like to be a glider tow pilot? So that, that was my first uh, flying job is a glider tow pilot. And uh, I, uh, in about four months, I uh, towed about 2,000 uh, glider flights and put in about 400 hours. It was in Super Cubs and an L-19 Bird Dog. And uh, then, uh, now it's 1970, early 1970, and there's a draft lottery going on. You guys all know about that. Well, 
I end up with a really, really low number in the draft lottery. And so I checked into it and I realized I was going to get drafted in, within two months. It was less than 50. I was 40 something. So I told my boss, hey, I'm sorry, I can't work here anymore. I'm going to get drafted. And, so uh, and I'm thinking, well, what, what am I going to do now? You know, I, my whole plan was to, you know, go back up to Alaska and live. So, so then I thought, well, there's a Alaska Air National Guard up there. I wonder if I could, you know, get on with Alaska Air National Guard. So uh, I said goodbye to them and hopped back in uh, the Luscombe and flew up to Alaska. The same 50 hours, 33 fuel stops, all the way back up to Alaska. Except this time I went to Anchorage instead of Fairbanks and. Uh, so uh, they offered me two positions there after I took all the tests and everything. And one was an electronics uh, position that had a year of training. And the other was as a flight line mechanic, an aircraft mechanic on recip uh, engines. And so I said, I'll take that. <laughs> so, uh, so then I ended up in you know, San Antonio, went through uh, all the military stuff. And, and uh, then back, uh, so that was from April. And then training uh, as a mechanic was all over in uh, September. So. Uh, then I'm now I'm back in Alaska permanently because I got you know six-year commitment and I'm going to be in Alaska so uh, I got a job uh, working at the University of Alaska and uh, I met a guy that had some land that uh, he wanted to sell and uh, so I bought the land and started building a cabin and then uh, then uh, Georgia enters the picture my wife-to-be and she uh, she was also a nice uh, Santa Monica girl and I don't know how she ended up in Alaska but uh, she had in the meantime gone to Hawaii and uh, so I said hey why don't you come on up and spend some time in Alaska this was in June of 1971 and so I sent her a ticket and she came up and we were married three weeks later ah. <laughs> But we knew each other for about, well, uh, since she was about 12 years old and I was about 14, so just as, you know, friends of the family. But, uh, so, uh, so she and I finished building the cabin, and uh, so that, uh, by the time we finished the cabin, it was October. And so uh, now I'm thinking, well, I'm flat broke, I spent all my money on the cabin, and uh, I'm trying to find a job, and I'd like to get a flying job, but I only had like a little less than a thousand hours flying time. So I found out that doesn't get you much in Alaska, a thousand hours of flying time, especially with no Alaska experience other than my Luscombe a little bit. How much time were you putting into the Air National Guard? Well, it was just, it was a, a part-timer. So, so just one uh, weekend a month, and then uh, a two-week drill. So you a real job, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it was, uh, you know, as a reservist, basically. Sure, sure. And uh, we were working on C-123s. We had seven C-123s and a, a C-54 and the Convair 580, uh, whatever that military designation is for that airplane. We had one of those too. But so, uh, so I started poking around all these air services and nobody was interested in hiring me as a pilot. Well, one of the air services uh, called Fort Yukon Air Service uh, said that, hey, we need somebody to, you know, wash airplanes and gas airplanes and load freight and go down to the post office and pick up mail and, and all that stuff. So I said, okay, I'll take it. And uh, so uh, that was in October of uh, 1971 and uh, did that all winter long and uh, I really was working, trying to do a really good job because I, my idea was eventually they would let me fly as a pilot. So uh, in early 1972, uh, they, uh, they hired a couple of pilots and you know, I got to talking to them. They didn't have very much more time than me. And I said, well, of course, I was, I was uh, Mr. Johnny on the spot, you know, doing all this work on the ground. And, they couldn't replace you. Yeah, so. they couldn't replace me. Yeah. So, so, uh, so I had an idea. I, I wrote uh, Fred Robinson, who was the, the, ran Great Western Soaring School in, that I just uh, spoke of earlier. And I asked him, do you think you could send me up a, a recommendation? You know, uh, I did a lot of flying for him, almost 500 hours and 2,000 two toes. And sure enough, he right away he responded. And, I uh, came into work one day and he said, hey, we're going to let you fly this 182. And uh, so that's how I got started. This was about May of 1972. And they had me on some real easy flights, all, all VFR, just real easy flights. And, uh, you know, they checked me out IFR, but, you know, they just let me fly VFR. And so I start, started to slowly build up my time just flying to, uh, we had a lot of mail runs. Uh, basically, we're here in Fairbanks. And uh, 
uh, Fort Yukon Air Service kid runs to all these little villages up here, and then some over here, and then as far this way, and then in, actually into Canada, a place called Boundary right here. And we did uh, a lot of uh, mail runs, and so uh, I got in a little bit on those, and uh, then my boss, uh, his name was Tommy Olson, and he said, hey, we're gonna send you to Circle City, and you're gonna spend all summer long in Circle City flying tourists. And so Circle City is, uh, let me get my little pointer here. So here's Fairbanks and uh, Fort Yukon is right here and Circle City is right here. And there's a road called the Skis Highway that goes from Fairbanks, it's about 165 miles to Circle City. And so tons of tourists were coming up there. And so I flew uh, about 200 hours, I think I wrote it down here. Um, I had 100, for, for two months between June and August, uh, 169 flights, 845 passengers, and just under 200 hours. And they gave me a Cessna 206 to do all this work in. It was a 711 Fox Yankee, which was my first favorite 206. It was flying till just a very few years ago. It's off the register now, but it must have like 15,000 hours on it now. But uh, so uh, it, you know, it was all the airplanes up there get beat up pretty bad. They're, you know, they're with the freight and everything. And, so the, the headliner was hanging down in pieces, and I'm thinking, well, these tourists are gonna think this, this is just an airplane's falling apart. So one of the um, uh, male pilots came through and I asked him to bring me uh, a needle and some dental floss. And so on the next mail, we had mail runs every day to these little villages. And so uh, so I went, went to work on that headliner and got it all fixed up. And uh, and also I had my Luscom there. And uh, so, uh, uh, in between these flights every once in a while we had a little time and uh, my wife George and I uh, uh, had to do the laundry. There was no laundry facilities in, in uh, Circle City so we fly to Luscombe up to uh, Fort Yukon and do our laundry. And uh, there's a place, uh, we have a real good friend, uh, Rod and Sandy Herrick, and so here's Circle City and they, they uh, had a place on the Skis Highway called Eagle Creek. And so one day we decided to visit them because they were up there for the summer and we flew to Luscombe and just landed on the Steez Highway in Alaska. That's, that's a real common thing, you just land on highways and, <laughs> and uh, taxi down to their cabin they had down there and we spent the night with them and then I got up real early in the morning so we could get back in time to fly the tourists so nobody even knew we were there. And uh, so that went on till August and uh, so then now I'm back in Fairbanks and uh, you know, doing, um, you know, with the experience, I, now they really trust me with airplanes, so, you know, I can do the IFR flights and stuff. And uh, so I started flying just a regular mail run. So uh, we went uh, from uh, Fairbanks to Eagle, Fairbanks to Central Circle, Circle Hot Springs, up to Fort Yukon, Chalkissick, uh, Beaver, Stevens Village, Venatai, Arctic Village, all these places, and sometimes to Tanana and then uh, west of Fairbanks on the Yukon River to a place called Rampart. And also the pipeline was getting started right about then, so I was doing a lot of flying on the pipeline up to the Yukon River uh, to a place called Five Mile and then uh, places on up uh, in the pipeline corridor. Just mail? Uh, oh, uh, mail, freight, charters, everything. Just uh, snowmobiles, uh, dog sleds, uh, wow. you, you name it, we hauled it. Uh, wow. As, uh, to get a snowmobile, a small snowmobile into a Cessna 206, you have to take the skis off in the front, and then you turn it sideways and open both doors, and you kind of wiggle it in and take all the seats out, and uh, so just leave the pilot seat, and then the snowmobile will fit. So we flew an awful lot of snowmobiles. But so uh, anyway, so so I was flying until October, and then uh, we had this big blackboard, and uh, Tommy, our boss, would put all our names up in the flights we were going to do that day. So uh, around October, I wasn't on the board anymore. And he, he said, hey, Bob, uh, and we need you over here to load this airplane. And uh, so I said, okay. So I went over, gassing airplanes, loading airplanes, doing what I was doing before I started flying. And uh, so after about two weeks of that, I said, you know, this isn't really what I'm here for. And so I went into his office. And I said, uh, Tommy, how come I'm not doing any flying anymore? He said, well, we need you to load airplanes. And, I said, well, I, I'm really a pilot. I'm, I, I, I'm not interested in loading airplanes anymore. He said, well, if you feel that way, you can just leave. So he fired me. Oh! So, <laughs> that's the first time I got fired by him. I got fired twice by him. Oh. But uh, for nothing to do with what I was doing, he just, 
you know, needed me as a, you know, to load freight. And he thought, well, you can just load freight. So, so uh, George and I, uh, we had a, our first child, uh, Alika, had just been born. She was only about two weeks old. Oh, so we climbed in the car and uh, drove from Anchorage down to, uh, I mean, uh, from uh, Fairbanks down to Anchorage. And uh, I uh, found a job at a place called Central Air. And uh, they had a Cessna 180. I'd never flown a Cessna 180 before. And so I think I wrote it down here. Uh, my very first, uh, uh, and most, most of you know I, I own a Cessna 180, and I've owned it for 32 years. Sure. It's a 1958, and I use it for the Young Eagles and the Angel flights and stuff. But anyway, so my first uh, uh, Cessna 180 flight was in November 19, 1972. And around the Anchorage area, all along Cook Inlet here, there's uh, drilling rigs, and oil drilling rigs, and not offshore, but, and so I was, uh, uh, that was my job, is flying uh, stuff out to these uh, drilling rigs in this Cessna 180. The only trouble was, I sometimes I only had one flight a day, and uh, I was getting paid by the hour, and it was I was just kind of starved to death. So where, where were the rigs? Uh, they were all along Cook Inlet here. Here's Anchorage, and uh, let's see if uh, it was a place called Granite Point, and I don't think it's so such a small place. So, I, so if you had one flight a day, how how long did it out and back? Oh. 15, 20 minutes, so I mean... So I, you were making that much yeah, all that. Yeah, it was a short flight. I, I, I always thought of the rigs up on the north slope, but that was later, I guess. Uh, I, I did a lot of that, too. Uh, oh, that, okay. that comes a little later, but... Uh, so anyway, um, so I started looking in the paper, and here's this area called Bethel, right in here. This is southwest Alaska. It's all Eskimos, and there's 37 villages here within one hour's flying time of Bethel. Saw an ad in the paper uh, uh, for a pilot to fly in Bethel, and so I called the number and I described it, you know, the 180 flying, and it was the 180 I was going to be flying in Bethel. And they said, yeah, come on out. And uh, so I did, and uh, uh, Georgia had to stay uh, back in Anchorage because we had a dog that had gotten pregnant, and we had to give away the pups and everything, and so I, and plus I didn't know if this was going to work out or not, so I went by myself for probably the first three or four weeks, and. Uh, so um, the first flight in Bethel was uh, November 5th, 1972. And uh, all this area is flat as a pancake. And you've got mountains up here, but this is all flat as a pancake. And so the way flying works in Bethel, all these villages here are, um, you know, Eskimo villages. And so you'd, you'd fly from uh, Bethel, you know, with a full tank of gas and go to, these runs are sometimes only 15 or 20 minutes long. And if you weren't going to go in hours, like going from Bethel up to about here, and uh, and you get to a, a village and you collect money just like a taxi cab driver, and uh, so when you got to a village like uh, say Kipnuk or Shafornik, then somebody there would want to go to another village, and so you, instead of going you know back and forth to Bethel, you just hit all these uh, villages until you got about a quarter tank of gas. And then you head back to Bethel for fuel and start all over. <laughs> so uh, that's that's kind of the nature of the uh, flying. And so, no, so do you have skis on your plane? Not, that comes later. Oh, right, right now I'm on wheels. It's, oh, okay. Uh, it's it's in November and I, I'm, I'm operating on wheels. And there is there is snow on the ground, but it's not deep, so it can just land with wheels. So so there are other choice besides paying the big money to you. They could have dogs pull their. Sled or well, that'd be awful slow. Yeah, I mean, okay. yeah so uh, the, the airplane was what kept all these villages, you know, in, with all their supplies and everything, and wow. people going back and forth. So uh, that's kind of the way it was in Bethel. Well, uh, after early uh, December, I came out to fly, and I found a big chain around my propeller with a lock on it. And, and there was a notice, an official looking notice. And what had happened was the other pilot that was working there had not been paid in quite a long time. And uh, my boss was named Joe Salison. It was called Del Air Charter. And he was famous for not paying pilots. <laughs> and so uh, so I talked to him. I said, uh, you, is that why the chain is on the prop and I can't fly because you're suing somebody? He said, yeah, he's, he hasn't paid me a dime in all the flying I've done. And, so uh, finally, about a week later, he settled up, and uh, this pilot, I can't remember his name now, but he told me, be careful, you, you make sure that when you collect the money, you pay yourself first before you give it to Joe. Oh. So that's what I started doing. I had a, a little 
a little spiral bound notebook and I wrote down each place and how much money I collected and what my hourly rate was. And I can't even remember what the hourly rate was, but it wasn't a lot. <laughs> you know, he didn't pay very well. So, uh, so I would, uh, you know, turn in the money at the end of the day to Joe in uh, Bethel, and he'd say, "Oh, where's all the rest of the money?" I said, "Well, I'm, I'm just taking my wages because we had to buy food and everything. We had the little baby, only a few months old then." So Joe wasn't happy about that. And if you look at my logbook, you'll see a whole bunch of red checks. And he wanted to see my logbook, and he checked every one of those flights in the logbook to see if it matched the little spiral bound. It takes one to know one. Yeah. So when, when you were doing uh, IFR, how much of this was IFR? Uh, a lot of it, but it wasn't official IFR. You didn't like file a flight plan. Yeah. And, I mean, you just it was IFR. Well, were there navigators around here? How did you? Uh, there was a VOR here in Bethel, and. Uh, in, uh, what, the way you uh, uh, ended up at a village, it was all uh, you know dead reckoning, and also uh, you know a radial off of the Bethel VOR. You have DME on there? Yeah, DME. Yeah. Uh, no DME. This. Uh, yeah. So it just. Well, what if you had a little whiteout condition? How do you know where you are? I'm getting to that. Oh, okay. One of my <laughs> flights has scared me to death. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's coming right up. Okay. <laughs> but, so anyway, we had HF radio in the airplane, and all the villages had HF radio, and there was a certain frequency everybody used. I don't remember what it was. Some 31 something. And uh, so. Uh, we would call, and uh, the uh, landing areas in these villages were changing constantly because of the, the conditions. Like yeah. one day you'd run a land on a river, and uh, the other day, a lot of them didn't even have airports, so you, you were just, you know, they had areas they set aside and they put down some sort of markers. Uh, no, no regular like runway. What lights. kind of markers? Like they got oh, fire just, or uh, something? You know, just uh, fire pots or. Yeah. You know, just anything that they had handy to kind of mark out a runway. Usually, there was only the ends that they marked. It. So um, that's the way that's the way we did it. And uh, so, um, let's see, uh, let's look at this. Get this. So, yeah, I was, I was collecting my own wages, and uh, so the very first thing that happened with this 180 it was an ancient 180. It had about 8,000 hours on it. 2194 Zulu is the was the end number on it, and uh, so I was going into Marshall, uh, which is here's Bethel, and Marshall uh, came up a couple times in my ventures up there, but uh, Marshall is right about uh, there it is right there. So here's Bethel and here's Marshall. So I was coming into uh, Marshall uh, at this time on wheels, and uh, I was putting my flaps down, and I had 40 degree flaps down, and I was about 200 feet in the air. All of a sudden, I heard this horrendous bang. Uh -oh. And what happened is the left flap went from full 40 degrees to full up. And the right flap was still 40 degrees, and the airplane started going upside down. And I, so you know how 180s have a Johnson bar. And so luckily I grabbed that first before I tried to figure out what else was going on. I slammed that Johnson bar down and uh, you know got control of the airplane again. It was just about 200 feet in the air. So I landed, and uh, then I looked out at the left wing, and the left flap came all the way down, and the right one's up now, because it's I had retracted the flaps. The right one's up, and the left one's down. So, so I got my screwdriver out, and I opened up some inspection plates. And what had happened is the turnbuckle on the flaps had not been safety wired, no safety wire at all. Can you believe that? And I, I can't believe that it was the factory that did that. I don't know, but uh, this airplane had 8,000 hours on it. It was a 63, and so this is 19. 72, so uh, you know, nine years old. But uh, so I uh, kind of put the, you know, got the turnbuckle going back in, and you know, I knew it wasn't going to come loose just on a short flight to Bethel. And so I told my boss what happened, and he, he was terrible with maintenance. Uh, he he just didn't believe in maintenance. <laughs> so I said, well, look, I'm not flying this airplane until you know you inspect it real good and get this thing properly safety wired. So he did. Must have been related to Amelia. <laughs> oh, that was a low one. <laughs> did you carry a, a, a rifle? I didn't carry a, anywhere? I didn't carry a rifle, but I carried a survival kit, and it I had uh, I carried raisins, signal mirror, uh, mosquito stuff, and uh, that sort of thing. No rifle, no pistol. No. Well, I mean, I was always you know no matter where I was, I, I wasn't gonna you know be down. Where I was in the wilderness for a couple of weeks or anything, but uh, 
So I, I didn't carry that. Uh, you know, we probably should have, but none of the other pilots did too. But we all carried survival kits, and we all carried an emergency locator. Besides the, you know, one in the airplane. We uh, actually back then I'm not sure they had locator beacons. That was in 1972. Did they have locator beacons? Was that by FAA? Uh, Regs in '72. No. Yeah. So anyway, we each had our own survival beacon that we carried and put it in the airplane. Just sat it on a seat or something. But. Uh, so I survived that, and uh, I ended up in Marshall again uh, on a real bad weather day. I, I got stuck in these villages about three or four times uh, just from really low flying. And uh, so one of the times I got stuck was in Marshall, and it was in uh, either December or early January. And uh, so uh, the, the school teacher met me, and he said, hey, you can stay in the schoolhouse if you like. And so. Uh, they have something called Russian, this is a kind of a, a large Russian influence in this whole area of Alaska. And so they have something called Slavic. And what that is, is they, it's part of Russian Christmas. And uh, so they'll have a family host the whole town and they'll put out all kinds of, you know, different foods and stuff, mostly native foods. And uh, so that night they, they were Slavic. So I went with the school teacher and I tried seal oil, which is rotten walrus. They, they get a walrus and they put it in the ground for a couple of months and then it's called seal oil. And I tried that and I, ugh. It's, uh, and uh, tried a little Eskimo ice cream and Eskimo ice cream is uh, Crisco with berries pressed into it, pure Crisco. And, uh, but I, I kind of liked that. I just had a little bit of that and they had uh, all kinds of other delicacies. So the next day I got back to, uh, all these villages connected with phones, radios, or how? how did no, no, uh, it was uh, HF uh, radios. Oh. You know, uh, uh, HF radio. Uh, the name of the radio was Northern Something. Every village had a you know a radio in it, yeah. and some people had radios in their home. So, yeah. the, uh, back to how I got the trips. Uh, there was a, a radio operator at the air service, basically my boss, and he was uh, there monitoring the radio and taking. Somebody say, hey, we want you to come down to Tanunik and uh, pick up somebody and take them here. And so that's how all the flights uh, were arranged. There was no, no kind of uh, phones or anything like that back in those days. But, uh, I'm, I'm curious. Describe the big city of Marshall because you keep talking about it. Oh, it's only about uh, probably a couple hundred people. All these villages have two or three hundred people in them. Oh. And just for fun, I'm going to read all the villages off to you. I've got them listed here. There's uh, 37 villages, and I'll just read them off because the names are really interesting. I think you'd like to hear them. Yeah, I assume that's the one names. So uh, here's the 37. Tuntatuliak, Shivak, Pilot Station, Akiak, Kweefluk, Kasigaluk, Napakiak, Napaskiak, Taluksak, Shifornik, Nunapachuk, Atmutkluk, Nuktak, St. Mary's, Kipnuk, Marshall, which is also Fortuna Ledge, that was the other name for Marshall. Uh, Akiachuk, Kaniganek, Quingilingup, Tuksuk, Mountain Village, Atmutluk, Eek, Good News Bay, Holy Cross, Antioch, Caltag, Kalskag, Tanunik, Makorik, Imanik, Shagala, Grayling, Nickmute, Quinnaguk, Nutok, and Alukanuk. Okay, so, <laughs> so those, those are the 37 villages that uh, I was flying to down there. And most, like I said, are just a couple hundred people, you know, just, so. Uh, Thank God that wasn't part of the field sobriety test. <laughs> from the last guy who was patrolled. So let's see. Uh, okay, so now we're getting to skis. So now the snow is, there's more snow now. It's January 9th and there's too much snow to be flying on wheels anymore. So, so Joe puts skis on the airplane, and these are straight skis. You know, some skis uh, have, uh, like federal skis, uh, have a little hydraulic pump, and you can either land on wheels or skis, but these are straight skis. They were made by Landis, and they're a fiberglass ski. And uh, so I'm thinking to myself, I've never flown a ski plane before, and so I, uh, there, I one of the other, there's about four air services in Bethel, and. A guy named Ace Jaros. I, I approached him and said, "Hey, would you go in the airplane with me and for my first few landings on skis?" And so he got in the airplane and we did four or five touch and goes, and it was just like wheels. I mean, it, it was no big deal. Of course, there was no wind or anything. And so, uh, was the, the tire protruding through the ski? 
The what? Does the tire protrude through? No, the tire's off. So you're totally yeah. The tire's the gone. Okay. And, uh, so there's just an axle, and so uh, the ski is like uh, it's got a center section. It's kind of a you know it's got a uh, you know a, the axle. A, a bearing in the yeah, middle yeah, of it, yeah. and then slides onto the axle. And it's all rigged with, uh, you know, so the skis, you can't have the skis straight because when you start to descend, it'll tuck under. Oh. And so uh, they're, they're rigged so they're up, they're up a little bit, maybe six inches or so. And so you've got rigging on both ends and bungee cords. And so it's uh, quite a, and then you have safety wires that are uh, stainless steel. Mm -hmm. And so if a bungee breaks, it won't like, say the, uh, Say the front bungee broke, well that ski would go down like that and then you'd have real problems. So there's these little safety cables that, in case that happens. So uh, so anyway, I learned how to fly skis. And uh, so some of the interesting things about skis, uh, if you're landing into a wind and you're on a glare surface or if you're on a real wet surface, the airplane will just weathercock right into the wind. And so you always have to allow for that. You try to land as close to the wind as you could. And so some of the places I land were frozen lakes. And so, you know, maybe I had to let off the freight down at the end of the lake. And so I'd land and stop as soon as I could, which is just by friction. There's no brakes. And uh, so now you want to turn around and come back. So, so you, you, uh, you know, gun it a little bit to get some air over the, the, uh, a rudder and uh, kick the left rudder and so now it swings around but guess what the winds from here and it wants to come right back so at first I couldn't figure out what to do and then then I got to thinking well okay so it's as far as it'll go so I kicked the right rudder real hard and then I got it swinging the other way and then when it went as far as it went I kicked the left rudder and pretty soon I had these big swings going and and it's like a boat you know when you uh, you know ready about come to Lourdes and and uh, so you kick it around and eventually you get it so it'll go past the wind and now you have it on the tail and then you can get back to where you're going. So when you landed uh, in tight areas on skis, you wanted to try to land as short as possible because if, uh, you wouldn't have to turn around and you could just take off straight ahead. And uh, if, if you were so unfortunate to get uh, to a place where you couldn't take off, the only solution if it's tight, like it, it was a lot of times, is you have to kick the you know, kick the uh, the little ski on the back of the airplane and get it moving about two or three inches over. Then you go up to the front ski and you kick it, and then you kick the back and you kick the front. And you repeat that about 50 times, and you can get it, you know, far enough around where you could taxi back. And uh, so, uh, in uh, in deep, heavy snow, uh, you know, you you can't turn in a real tight radius, and so. Um, that was a problem with the skis. And one time I landed in this real restricted area. It was kind of like a big bowl, but it was a long, you know, a long bowl, like a runway, but it was sloped up on both sides and there was a real strong crosswind. And I landed and I had no control there. The airplane just went right up the, right up the side of this ramp and then it, it slid backwards. And luckily nothing bad happened. I was, I was sure that that was- This is the back of the ski. Does it have a, an upward slope or is it straight? Well, on the tail wheel yeah. has a little ski. No, I don't mean tail wheel. The back of the ski, the front of it has a shovel. Does the back of it have a shovel? No. So it could dig in. Well, no, I wasn't worried about that. I was worried about somehow the airplane sliding down sideways and they get caught on something. And okay. so, but luckily it kind of went up and then it just slid right back down. And <laughs> so uh, there's uh, all kinds of things like that. You lucked out. Yeah, I lucked yeah. out. I had a lot of lucking out. But, uh, so, uh, okay, now we're getting to uh, this one flight that, uh, it was January 31st, 1973. Uh, oh, there's one before that. Uh, this was a flight uh, that was no big deal except just being over uh, the ocean. It, it was right here. Uh, this is Tuxup Bay here, and this is uh, McCorrick. And so to get, get across here, this is called the Etolan Strait. And I'm going across here in this old beat up airplane and the, the water down there is like 39 degrees and there's huge waves and I'm flying across there and I'm saying, it doesn't matter if I had a flight plan or, I'm done. If, if, I, if that airplane has a problem, I'm done. Mm -hmm. But uh, I only had to do that flight once and it, you know, if it had been a real good airplane, 
I wouldn't have worried about it too much doing that regularly, but I only have to do that one time. How much that. distance were you over ocean? That's 30 miles. Oh. From here to here is 30 miles. Question. Yeah, I measured it. I have a question. When you're over water or rocks and trees, does that make your engine run? Right? Yes, it does. <laughs> you know that. It always does that. <laughs> Just like at night it does it. <laughs> okay, so, so now we get to this other flight. And so it's, um, here I am in Bethel, and it's a horrible, horrible day. And uh, it is, it's about 500 overcast and maybe a, maybe a mile of visibility. And uh, my charter that day was to go from Bethel up to the Yukon River to this place called Grayling here. And there's another place that's not labeled, but it's over here. It's called, oh, here it is, Shagalark. And so basically my plan was to take a heading, just, just a heading because their you know, visibility was so bad. And then uh, when I hit the Yukon River, I would just stay uh, right on the edge of it and then get to my villages. Well, that was, that was a good idea. And so I was... Uh, going along holding a heading and I was looking out, uh, this, by the way, this is all tundra here, this is no trees, but there's a lot of trees up here. Mm -hmm. So I'm going along and uh, looking out the window. At 500 feet. Yeah, 500 yeah, feet, yeah, yeah. and following the trees. Yeah. And that's how I was staying upright. And all of a sudden, the whole world went white. And what happened was, you could probably guess what happened. See all these lakes here? No, they're lakes, I went over a lake. Oh. So now I got no trees, and I'm just and it's, the whole world is white. And then so I, I look back at the uh, at my horizon, and I could swear I was in a 30 degree bank, but the horizon was yeah. low, <laughs> and it it was the worst vertigo I've ever had in my life. And I, I wanted so badly to turn because I thought I was in a big bank, and a, yeah. but the horizon was said level, and I and slowly my my ears kind of unwound and. And uh, so I very carefully uh, turned the airplane back around, and I could, you know, home in. Took a heading to Bethel, and then I, I get the VOR and uh, go on in, and I landed. And so that same day, there was another pilot that was flying a nurse, and he was in a, a Cessna. I'm not sure what kind. And uh, he went missing. And uh, what happened was he was flying an airplane that did not have an artificial horizon, and he lost control of the airplane and augered in. And uh, I helped uh, look for the airplane, and it was two days later before they finally found him. He was going from Bethel to a little village just up about here, and he lost control of the airplane almost right away. And uh, so there was only two of us flying that day, and I made it back, and he didn't. And uh, and that uh, that seasoned me up probably a year's worth on that one flight. So. I had a lot of respect, uh, and I, I think I raised my personal minimums at that point. Uh, but uh, so there was that flight. Well, and, what was it about the weather that particular day, or something? Well, it was just low. It was about a mile visibility. There was some snow falling and a, a low overcast. And but see, there's no, there's nothing to hit here. So uh, <laughs> it's all ground. So <laughs> I, I wasn't worried about you know staying at 500 feet. That wasn't a problem. But I, but. Uh, uh, not having the trees and then you know sure. so I didn't want to keep going because there's a lot more lakes up here and I got to thinking this was a bad idea because I didn't even consider the lakes and there's lots of lakes up here uh, I just see them see all these lakes here uh, so it was going to happen again and uh, I just this is really I just my personal alarm went off inside of me I said this this is not the day to be flying you have no business here and I went back to Bethel and so sure enough that, that's the way it turned out but uh, so, um, so then I uh, continued flying uh, in Bethel for another, let's see, I guess three or four hundred hours I put in in Bethel, and uh, got into uh, about April, and uh, my boss uh, was married uh, to a woman from North Carolina, and they, I knew they were having some real bad marital problems, and she took off and went back to North Carolina, and so then he took off, and followed her to North Carolina. Well, now there was nobody to man the radio. And so we weren't getting any calls, and so I mean, <clears throat> what, what do you do? And so I was basically not flying. And uh, my wife and I discussed it. We had, a, you know, our baby was only a few months old, and this is a horrible place. We were living under very primitive conditions with no real plumbing or anything. And we just decided this isn't the place for us. We need to leave. And so uh, Georgia became a taxi cab dispatcher. <laughs> And I, and I got a taxi cab license, and I, I uh, drove cabs for about two weeks. 
and we got just enough money to get ourselves on a Wien Alaska flight back to Anchorage, plus our two dogs. We had. What were you driving the cab? Uh, in Bethel. In Bethel, that's yeah. big enough to have yeah. a cab. There, wow. By the way, there's no no streets or numbers in Bethel. You just have to know where everybody lives. <laughs> and if you don't know, they'll tell you. So it's like 200 people? Uh, no, Bethel is a lot larger, about oh. two 2,000 or more oh. at that time. Now I think it's more than probably three or 4,000 because it's the center of this whole area here. So so uh, my wife was the dispatcher and I was a cab driver for about two or three weeks. And uh, we got just enough money to buy those tickets and went back to Anchorage. And so when we got back to Anchorage, uh, I started uh, flying again with this 180 that uh, had uh, you know, same thing, Central Air Service. And I was doing a little more flying because it was a better time of the year. It was, this is the guy that fired you? Then? No, no, that was up in Fairbanks. Oh. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, flying back in uh, Anchorage area to these uh, oil rigs. And uh, so, again, I wasn't making quite enough money to really make a living. And, uh, you know, being in the Alaska Air National Guard, when it came to the end of the financial year, sometimes they had to use up money, you know, in order to get the same amount of money the next year, the yeah. way the government works. And so basically they hired me for uh, to be uh, full-time person in the guard and so I did that for one month to uh, so I worked every day and uh, so we recouped our finances and uh, so uh, George and I and our young daughter uh, drove back up to Fairbanks and so we got to our cabin I said what are we going to do in Fairbanks Tommy fired me so there's a note on the cabin saying we want you to come to work ah! Remember, signed by Tommy Olson and who knows that note was probably there two, two or three months and uh, it was just on the cabin door, and so I went to see him, and he said, Hey, Bob, good to see you. It, and he knew that I'd been in Bethel and done all this flying. And he, he said, I, I got this really great job for you. We're going to send you up to a place called, let's see, where's Bettles? Uh, Bettles is up about here, and you're going to haul fuel to all these villages in that same airplane I described earlier, the 206 with the fuel tank in it. And I said, well, look, i got a little baby now, and I just can't do that. He said, okay, you can fly in Fairbanks. And so, just like that, he said, okay, you don't, we won't send you up there, we'll send somebody else up there. And so, uh, then I started with Air, uh, uh, Fort Yukon Air Service again, and they changed their name to Air North. And, uh, but it's the same company. And so, so now I'm back in um, Fairbanks. So, uh, let's see. So, uh, Where, where's your cabin and all this? Oh, it's it's right outside of Fairbanks. Uh, so it was uh, just too far to you couldn't stay at it while you were in these far flung places. Sometimes. No, no. The cabin is basically in Fairbanks, yeah. it's, uh, three miles north of the University of Alaska, and we still have that cabin. Oh, we really? Rent it out one year at a time. It's uh, and rent it to a grad student right now. But, uh, so, um, so I started flying the regular mail runs to all the little villages that I was pointing out before. And um, that went on till, uh, let's see. Yeah, that was in, this is uh, 1972, or 1973 now. And uh, so by this time I was flying so much, I just wasn't even flying the Luscombe, it was just sitting there. So I, I sold the Luscombe for uh, <laughs> $2,650, I made a $150 profit on it, <laughs> and just appreciation, I guess. And uh, the guy who bought it uh, crashed it about five hours after I had sold it to him, and what it, it, it wasn't his fault. It was a fuel line that had started to break apart inside, and little pieces of rubber were unknown, unbeknownst to me. Plugged up the fuel it, flow? Yeah, it, was, it stopped the fuel flow, and so then he rebuilt the airplane, and he sold it to another guy, and uh, I met that guy when he, he, he had just gotten a fresh private pilot ticket and uh, he told, I said, hey, that was my old Luscombe. And he said, oh yeah, I just bought this airplane. So what, what this guy did is he flew from uh, Fairbanks here to a place called Quail Creek, which is, I doubt it's even marked, but uh, Quail Creek is up in these mountains here. And uh, basically what happened is he ran out of airspeed and ideas and altitude all at the same time. <laughs> and so he crashed the Luscombe, and he was permanently crashed then. That was the end of the Luscombe. So that was the end of my airplane. I felt bad about that because I had such a good time with it the four years that I owned it. But uh, anyway, so I just made that little note about the Luscombe. He came out alive? 
Yeah, he was okay. Yeah, uh, it was a good airplane. Airplane gave its life for him. So, um, so then, uh, you know, just flying the regular mail runs, and, and now it's gone into 1974, and I, I had one of the most interesting and actually rewarding flights that I, that I ever did. Uh, I had been flying all day long to all these mail runs, and it was, uh, I was ready to go home. It was about five or six in the evening, and this is in uh, March, so it's uh, so still kind of, you know, a little bit dark. And uh, so my boss came up to me and said, hey, there's this guy in uh, Eagle that uh, is uh, got a, a kidney a kidney failure, and he needs to get to the hospital or he's going to die. And uh, so I said, it was snowing a little bit, and it was night. And uh, Eagle is right, let's see, Fairbanks. Eagle is right here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so here's a, here's the deal. It's snowing, and there's all these mountains here, and Eagle is surrounded by mountains, and it's an unlit strip, and it's night. And so I'm thinking, well, I'll never be able to do this flight. And I got to thinking, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just take off, and I'll see that there's icing, and then I'll just come back tell my boss so so I took off uh, this is about six or seven in the evening and uh, so I got up to my cruise altitude uh, these mountains here are about uh, 6,000 feet high and so I got up about 8,000 feet and I took out my flashlight and I looked out at the wing no ice just snow lots of snow and I had I turned off the landing lights because there's so much snow coming at me and uh, so okay well so I still got to get the Eagle. I mean, uh, so I, I had the Fairbanks VOR going and I knew the bearing to Eagle. The only trouble is it, it runs out about here and uh, we got to get to here and you lose the signal about here. So uh, I kept a very close uh, uh, heading on, the, on my uh, compass after I couldn't get the VOR anymore and I just, it was just time speed distance and uh, an hour and 25 minutes is what it takes to uh, get the Eagle. And uh, so when I, when I got to where Eagle should be, I looked down and I saw two lights down there. This, uh, and I didn't know what those lights were. But so I started to circle down because I knew it was safe to circle around the lights and I'd be you know, away from these mountains here and the mountains here. And I figured it out. The lights turned into two lights. And what it was is they had parked a car on each end of the runway. Mm -hmm. And there, there's no uh, runway lights or anything, but wow. they, they had uh, one car pointing one way on the runway and one car pointing the other way on the runway. And so I just kept circling down, circling down. And uh, then I got into, you know, I got low enough and I could see what was going on. And I landed and uh, picked up the guy. And uh, so I told the guys with the uh, cars, don't leave. Just stay here for 20 minutes after I take off. And my plan, my plan was to circle right above the lights mm -hmm. to you know stay away from the mountains, and so I circled right on around uh, all the way up back up to 7,500 or 8,500, and uh, then of course in Fairbanks I had a radio station, and uh, I, you know they, all the airplanes had ADFs in them, and so I just tuned the local uh, AM station, and uh, I, re I remember it was the music was playing and it was two blue bells from the es Exorcist. <laughs> <laughs> the song I was listening to as I'm coming back and so and then I got the VOR and there was a cinch once I got back even though it was snowing a little bit and uh, I got back and landed and there was an ambulance waiting there at the airport. I, I'm just curious you see the two lights down there what made you say yeah these are the two lights? Well I figured as long as the lights were there I was you know there was nothing in between me and the lights if there had been okay but oh i see if yeah. there had been yeah. something but i mean you may have ended up in the next valley or something or well other. yeah i just circled over the lights wow. and, uh, so uh so that flight really taught me uh something uh it, it's that you can you can take a flight that looks very very difficult and break it into little components always have a way out as you're going and uh so uh, that that uh, I think that, that season me several hundred hours right there that flight but just I learned to do that from all my flights in the future is to just take it one little step at a time and you know say okay well I'm going to turn around if this doesn't work out and okay that's okay I'll go to the next step and so uh, that was a real good flight for me but uh, uh, let's see then uh, next flight I uh, uh, wrote down was uh, dogs lots of sled dogs and. There was this place called McGuire's Cabin, and it was on the Yukon River, and just a homestead. 
and this guy had a lot of dogs and he ran a track line out there and so I, I landed out there on skis and for uh, uh, two days, I hauled all his dogs back to Fairbanks. It was almost the end of the season. I wrote down the date as uh, April 25th, 26th, 27th of 1974. And the last flight I had, there was about uh, almost six dogs each flight that we chained to the seat rails. And on the last one, I had some really nasty dogs. And uh, they were fighting and uh, they were trying to get loose. And I thought, if they get loose, they're gonna come up and eat me. <laughs> and so I started taking the wheel going like this, <laughs> the elevator. And every time I did it, the dogs would calm down. Oh. And so I'd go another five or 10 minutes and you know, do that. <laughs> and I did that all the way back to Fairbanks. And uh, I taxied in and I got out of the airplane, I shut the door and I, I said, I'm, I'm done with the dogs. <laughs> They're your dogs, you take care of them. <laughs> the guy was waiting for his dog, so. Well, did, did they have any muzzles on the dogs? Uh, no. How do you hold them down in place? Uh, they were chained down. To to the tracks? To the tracks, the yeah. We kind of jury rigged it up. This has been assessed in 180. And how many dogs at a time would you take? Uh, six. <laughs> yeah, so I hauled 17 dogs into three runs. And uh, so, uh, and then I had another dog flight. Uh, there was a famous dog musher named George Atla. And he was uh, won almost all his races, and so he needed to go from Fairbanks to Tanana. So here's, uh, let's see, Fairbanks and Tanana is on the Yukon River right over here, about an hour and a half flight. And so uh, we took all the seats out except the pilot seat and one seat behind the pilot, and we put his sled in on the right-hand side of the airplane, chained the dogs all over the place in the. In, you know, in the rails of the sleds and everything, and he knew he was going to win, so he had about eight cases of beer, <laughs> and we put those in there, and then George sat in the seat behind me, and this wasn't a 180, it was a Cessna 206, mm -hmm. and I, I dearly wish I had a picture of that, because, you know, it was a full load with everything that was in there, and it just crammed with dogs and sled, and, and uh, I would have loved to have that picture, so that was my other little dog. Well, how did these guys come up with enough money to pay you? I mean, that'd be expensive to move these dogs around well they do uh, I mean in Alaska that's that's where all the money goes is snowmobiles and air transportation really it's uh, and of course if you well I always tell people to go to Alaska don't go on on an airline to Kotzebue and then see a dog sled on wheels I mean that's no way to see Alaska go go uh, to one of the local air services and have about six of you or five of you and all and you it goes by the airplane not by the person so you, you you know the airplane might be say three hundred and fifty dollars an hour you know because you know insurance and everything and, uh -huh. and but if there are five or six people or you know you get an hour for maybe sixty seventy dollars i mean and you could see you could have that pilot take you to all these neat places down low and so that's the way to see alaska so but uh, so then i had another flight this is in june now june 25th uh, uh, 1974 and the fish and game came to our air service and wanted to do some caribou surveys so uh, see I'm the 180 pilot so I get nabbed for that one and uh, so uh, we, we flew from Fairbanks to uh, here's Fairbanks we were counting caribou somewhere up in this area here the White Mountains and uh, so this guy wanted to go up all these narrow canyons, and I, I did one. You know, I got, it looked like enough room, and it was kind of a little, little hairy. And I said, "Boy, this is this isn't very smart." So I said, "Let me show you something." So, so we climbed up to the top of the mountains, and you know, we were going to go down this long valley. And so, if you've all flown you know, Cessnas with the barn door flaps, I put 40 degree flaps down, and added power like a slow flight, but with uh, 30, 40 degrees flaps. And I just, a little power, and I just came down like an elevator. <laughs> and, he, and he loved that. And he was counting the caribou right and left. And I was going along just above a stall speed. No, no danger at all, because it's all downhill, and you know, escaping right downhill. And so he said, boy, this is neat. And so, so we worked together for two or three days. And, and the reason they do the caribou counts is to set up the hunting seasons. And it's based on how many animals there are, and, you know, how many uh, you know, hunting tags that they can give out that year. So they like to keep track of the movements of all the herds, and you know. So that's what that was about. And uh, so about this time, I started to, uh, my boss wanted to check me out in uh, some twins. And so the first twin I flew was Aztec. 
And we used to call the Aztec our twin engine super cub, because uh, have any of you flown Aztecs at all? Uh, well, it has a big fat wing, just like a, a J3 Cub. It's a, it's a wonderful airplane for slow flight. And so the way we approach our flights is, forget about uh, blue line speed. You know, that's, that's for safety, but uh, you know, you're coming into a strip and you're committed to land. So now you can go right down to stall speed. And so we would take it right down to stall speed and there's no go around, you know, if you lost an engine or anything. And, and it landed just like a normal Cessna or something and you could land on a 1200 foot strip in an Aztec. Uh, and so uh, I started in that, I love the Aztec. It was, I, I think it was uh, one of my favorite twins that I flew up there. And uh, how many horsepower per side? Uh, 250, huh. yeah, so 500 horsepower. Hmm. Yeah, it had the uh, light combing, uh, no, I can't remember the model number now, but uh, anyway, two 250 horse. Uh, the Apache is the, was the forerunner of the Aztec, and it had these little, what, 160 horse engines or something, and if you lost an engine in that, you were going just slowly drifting down to below sea level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the uh, Aztec would hold 80, uh, 8,800 feet, if I remember right, the number on the Aztec for a single engine. And uh, so, um, so now I kind of, uh, so my boss, after he checked me out in the Aztec, he said, hey, we got this, uh, these neat fire patrol flights we want to send you on. So I was gone for uh, five or six days. And uh, uh, during uh, the summer, there's all kinds of fires in Alaska. I mean, they're all lightning caused. And uh, so we would fly all over Alaska around these fires and, uh, you know, keep track of them and, uh, you know, report to the smoke jumpers, to, you know, tell them where they needed to, to uh, go to uh, you know fight another fire and the BLM Bureau of Land Management uh, kept track of uh, you know all these fires and so this was a real good real good work for the air services in the summer of hundreds and hundreds of hours of flying we did on, on firefighting uh, so I did that for uh, let's see I wrote it down between uh, on the five days between August 6th and August 10th I flew 33 hours and um, no, uh, let's see, seven, oh, you know, I can't read my own writing, but it was about seven or eight hours a day, so, yeah, I guess about 33 hours would be right. So uh, then I was back in Fairbanks. I didn't like to be away. I, I like to be home, and so I didn't like these flights, but every once in a while I had to be out of town for a few days. So the next flight I wrote down, uh, this happened uh, on uh, April 30th, and uh, here in, uh, here's Fairbanks, and, uh, Battles is right here. There's a, a perfectly round lake right right about here, and it's called Sicily Dominica. <laughs> and it was actually, they figured it was a meteor that hit, like wow. maybe 20,000 years ago or something, because they found stuff in the ground that would indicate that it was a meteor. And so I was flying a couple guys in that had made this little cabin, and uh, off the lake and uh, so this is getting late in the season and so you have to worry about the lake not being quite frozen you know the, the uh, not a safe area to land on the lake on skis and so the way we handled that is uh, you know we wanted to land close to the shore because that's where his cabin was and so you'd make a pass uh, in, in the snow with your skis and you'd actually land but keep your speed up and so you'd make your tracks. Now you'd go back around and look at the tracks. If they're white, it's safe to land. If they're blue, you don't oh, land. Oh, yeah. And so if, it's, <laughs> if there's overflow underneath, wow. the water will come up and turn it blue, kind of a grayish blue. And so, so we landed, and uh, so the guy said, well, see you in two weeks. And so, you know, there's no GPSs now. You can't mark waypoints or anything. No, no Loran, no GPSs, nothing like that. Just the pilot making a mark on a map and saying, okay, this guy is here. So I said, are you sure? Uh, maybe we ought to check out your cabin before I leave. And so we went over, there was two guys, and we went over to the cabin, and uh, guess what? It was torn apart by bears. Ah. And the cabin was built out of these, uh, you know when they print newspapers, they have these kind of metal plates? if anybody's familiar with how they print newspapers. And so this cabin was made out of these metal plates. It was not very strong. And uh, so, uh, so they said, well, I guess that's the end of that trip. And they climbed back in the airplane and we went back to Fairbanks. So, huh. so uh, you, you really have to watch out for people up there. I mean, you're, you, you know, you have a lot of responsibility flying these people into different places and you, you know, want to make sure that uh, things are right for them before you. 
Uh, let's see. So then I started checking out in more twins about this time. Uh, BN2 Islanders, anybody know what that is? It's a really super airplane. It's made by Britt and Norman. It's a fixed gear twin, but it, it can haul a ton. Uh, I mean, literally 2,000 pounds. Wow. And it has two 260 horse light bonies. And so we did a lot of flying in that. It was slower than a 206. It only cruised at about uh, maybe 125 to 130 knots. And uh, so I got checked out on that. And we, we also had a, a Cessna 310, a really old one. And uh, so then about this time, uh, I got a few flights in the Beach 18 just as a second pilot. And so I kind of got introduced to the Beach 18. So then here's another ski uh, flight that was kind of interesting. Um, there was this guy running a trap line, and I can't remember exactly. Yeah, you said a trap line earlier with the, uh, the, the, the guy with the dog and the sleds. I yeah. don't know what you mean by that. Well, a trap line is, uh, so you set, uh, you set uh, you know, there's a line, and you set traps with bait. Oh, and you're, you're yeah, trying I'm to get like Jeevers or, or Martins, or, and so these guys live out in the wilderness, a lot of them in all different places. Uh, and uh, so anyway, this guy apparently hadn't paid his taxes in many a year. And so an IRS agent shows up at our air service and he says, uh, we need to go, go fly out. And he told us where it was. It was just somewhere in the boonies here. Uh, somewhere uh, kind of this direction from Fairbanks. I think it was kind of east. And so uh, my boss said, okay. So, so I loaded up the IRS agent and we had the coordinates of where we were going to go and I found a good place to land. and. Uh, so now I'm thinking to myself, should I stay with the airplane and let the IRS agent go down to this cabin <laughs> unbeknownst to what is going on at the cabin? Or should I go down with the IRS agent? I finally decided that I'd feel real bad if uh, the IRS agent got shot and then I just took off. <laughs> so I, I decided it Were you really? <laughs> I, I decided it was better <laughs> to go down with the guy. And the guy was real cooperative. He said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I yeah. <laughs> he was very apologetic. And so, uh, Here's three an inks and a wolf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, the guy agreed to pay all his taxes and away we went. So that uh, these flights. Now, that, with the IRS, was he back in heat? No, no, he wasn't. Innocently walked yeah. into this wow. cabin. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, it just that's people in Alaska are, in general, pretty decent people. But uh, I got a question about trap lines. Do they run out straight, or do they go around? I've never trapped, so I can't tell you. Mm. But they're long. I mean, sometimes they're what six, seven, eight miles long at least, and uh, sometimes there's more than one. And so there's these guys that just love to live in the wilderness, and that's how they make their money. Is uh, and then once a year, they'll take all their pelts in and sell them, and then they buy, uh, you know, guns and snowmobiles and whatever they need, and uh, go back out in the, in the boonies and do it again. So the, so the line's basically so you don't lose your trap, I guess. Yeah, it's, I think the line is more just meaning that, okay, it doesn't mean there's a physical line. It's a series of traps. Yeah, it's just a series of traps. Yeah, there's not really a physical line between them. Like that. But they know their own trails, you know, and they're, maybe they mark them some on blaze the trees or something. So uh, let's see, there's, there's the IRS flight. And uh, yeah. so now comes another uh, real learning experience. The, the date is uh, April 7th, 1975. And it's a 180 flight uh, with the University of Alaska. And uh, they're big on studying the northern lights up at the University of Alaska. So. Um, they send up these rockets with barium charges and they go up about 50 miles and they release the barium and, and make an artificial uh, northern lights and then study them. And so these guys were looking for a rocket that they sent up there. And of course there's no GPS in these days so it can't be located that way. So, um, so I load these three guys up. They're big guys so it's heavy and I've got full gas in the you know, 180 and it's right up to gross weight and maybe it's Maybe just a tad more. <laughs> so we take off from Fairbanks. This is it's an IFR kind of day, and uh, so we take off from Fairbanks. And these are the White Mountains here, and they're about 5,000 feet high. So my plan was to uh, punch through the clouds and then fly till I got to the Yukon Flats, and then circle down. Uh, this is all flat here, and then uh, there's also a VOR at Fort Yukon that I could get a radial off of, so I knew I'd be uh, safe there. Am I going too much now? I, I got oh, a little more to go. Keep going. Okay. So, so anyway, so I start uh, flying over to uh, the beginning of the White Mountains, and it's a 
it's warm. It's it's below freezing, but very warm and just perfect for icing conditions. And mm -hmm. I started to look out at the wings of this 180, and uh, it's getting some pretty serious ice uh, on the wings. And and there's ski planes, so all the ski rigging is getting ice, and the, the skis themselves are getting ice, and the prop is getting ice. Everything is getting ice. <laughs> and so pretty soon I'm only climbing like at about 300 feet a minute, and I'm not quite over the mountains yet. I'm right about right here. And I realize that this isn't going to work. I, if I go any further, I'll, I won't have any options and you know I'll be forced down in the middle of the mountains. So I turn around to go back to Fairbanks and I got climb power on and the airplane's losing altitude. Because I'm going right back through that same ice. And uh, so the airplane is losing altitude and I've got climb power on it. And so uh, I'm on ski so I can land almost anywhere. So, uh, are, are there trees down? <coughs> there are mountains. I would think there would be trees. Yeah, there's trees, but there's a lot of open oh, places. Oh, okay. And so I picked one out, and I'm looking at the temperature gauge, and it's like uh, 27 degrees, 28 degrees, 29 degrees as we're going down. Mm -hmm. And I get down to about three or 400 feet above the ground, and the temperature finally reaches 32. And all of a sudden, I just heard this tremendous racket. The, all the ice is slipping off the wings and slipping off the propeller and you know, you, the propeller's running a little rough as it you know the, the, the shed it quite evenly and so uh, we shed all the ice and uh, the only thing I think about on that flight is you know uh, we all know now you know don't use flaps when you're all iced up because you can stall out the tail and then you're gonna you know nose over but I didn't know that back then and I would have landed with 40 degree flaps and uh, who knows if I had, would have stalled out the tail because it would have been all iced up. So luckily I didn't have to land because we shedded all the ice. So I turned to the guys and said, hey, would you still like to go to Fort Yukon? And they said yes. <laughs> so, okay. So we did it the hard way then. So we're, uh, here's uh, Fairbanks and we're right about here. Well, there's this, you can't really see it too well, but there's a creek right here, Beaver Creek. And so we stayed down about 500 feet and went all the way along Beaver Creek here, and then it comes out about here. And uh, so actually, you can get all the way through the mountain. Yeah, yeah. So we did it the hard way. We instead of going straight here, we went all along here, following Beaver Creek, and then we got into the Yukon Flats. And we couldn't find the rocket, and so then we flew back to Fairbanks. And so it was about a five-hour flight with no stops. And in my logbook, it just says Metro to Metro because we didn't get any place, and we didn't land any place. And uh, so uh, that got my attention on what ice can do to an airplane. It's not, was not this, I assume this is the middle of the though. day, because you're going to look for it. Yeah, it's the middle of the day. Yeah. Wow. And uh, so uh, then I had two other bad icing incidents, uh, well, actually just one real bad one that was in the same area in a Beach 18, and uh, the windshield got all iced up, and when I came back to Fairbanks, the whole window was iced over, and so I had to land out the side window. And uh, but it had the icing gear on it; it had boots on it, and it also had an alcohol prop, so you could, uh, you know, have the alcohol going on the on the prop. So uh, uh, the only bad thing about that was the visibility. I, so, I don't know about an alcohol prop. It, oh, it, it's got these little spigots uh, right at the hub of the prop. And you've got a, a little a rheostat and you can control the flow. There's a little alcohol tank in the cockpit. It smells really nasty. It's, a, <laughs> uh, it's not regular. It's a isopropyl alcohol. Or, mm. uh, Anyway, you can control it, and you just turn the real stat, and you can hear the ice coming off the propeller, so you get it set. So you don't want to set it too high, or you'll run out of uh, sure. the fluid, or too low, you won't be. So you have to kind of judge by the sounds you're getting on uh, how to set it. Huh. And so, the defrost wouldn't keep the windshield uh, No, it was just it. totally iced over. It had uh, maybe an inch of ice on it. And so uh, there's railroad tracks that run along our uh, airport on the side. So I followed the railroad tracks, and at the last minute, I just kicked it around and, you know, just kept my head looking out the side window to make sure I didn't get too close to the edge. And, and uh, my boss wasn't around to see that. I know he wouldn't have been very happy about that. And uh, Tommy Olson. We also called him Mott No Slow. That's Tommy Olson backwards. <laughs> and, uh, he was a character. He was an original Yankee trader kind of guy, you know. So, uh, so there was that flight, and uh, 
So, so now uh, I'm getting checked out in the Beach 18. And uh, at that time, they were doing a lot of oil exploration right up here. It, this is Point Barrow here. And uh, this is Prudhoe Bay. See all these little islands here? There's one called Ra uh, Reindeer Island, and one called Midway Island. Well, what these guys would do, they had cat trains out on the Arctic Ocean. And uh, they would set off uh, uh, dynamite charges. And by uh, measuring the echo, they could tell if there was oil there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, our job was to haul up uh, not only food, but the blasting caps and uh, dynamite. And we never carried the two together. It was one whole mm -hmm. flight of blasting caps or one whole flight of dynamite. <laughs> so so, so uh, the beach, it was a five hour round trip from Fairbanks to these uh, offshore about 20 miles into the Arctic Ocean. Actually, it says Beaufort Sea here, but it's really part of the Arctic Ocean. And uh, so they would just give us uh, a heading to fly off Dead Horse. So we'd fly over Dead Horse and uh, then take the heading and hopefully find it, you know, 20, 25 miles out. And uh, it's sometimes real hard to find with the weather and everything. And the wind was always blowing kind of out of the northeast at about 20, 25 miles an hour. So when you landed, you couldn't shut the engines down because those radials would you know, cool down too fast. And so it was 40 below zero. And so uh, we left the engines running and you'd unload it. And uh, an unfortunate thing about the Beach 18 is you can't fly five hours without adding some oil, at least the ones we had. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my last job was to crawl out uh, behind the running engines and uh, kept a jug of oil, five gallons of oil. And uh, so I put the oil in the engine while the engine's running. <laughs> and uh, so I'm almost done, but not quite. So uh, this whole process took about 20 minutes for lo uh, loading, you know, unloading and, uh, uh, you know, uh, putting the oil in and everything. So the last thing you did is we had this long screwdriver with a blade about this long. And you have to get underneath the engines and uh, the breathers would start icing over. And so you had to take the screwdriver and ram it up the breathers to knock the ice out. Otherwise you blow the seals on the engine when you take off. So, uh, so then we, uh, and the other thing was it was an electric landing gear and you pop the circuit breaker if you tried to raise and lower the gear at a normal altitude. So we had to go up to about 3,000 feet to, uh, you know, before we tried to raise and lower the gear, because there was always an inversion. So, and, you know, 40 below on the ground, but maybe 25 or 20 below in the air. So, you know, you would uh, pop the circuit breaker. So, uh, and I did a whole bunch of those flights. When and you're putting the oil in and the propeller's spinning, are you getting a face full? kind of block it. Yeah, it had a, the filler was on the side of the engine. So you wouldn't get too much on No, you just kind of, you know, I had a park on with the hood and everything, just kind of, you know, go like this, and I had a big funnel. And Were you on a ladder, or what? Well, no, just on the wing. Oh. Yeah, you know, the, the cells come right off the wing, oh. and uh, just like an E-twin, and uh, the little oil oil uh, filler uh, door was right there on the in on the inboard side of the engine. You know how much it was going to consume in five hours? Or? Yeah, it, it would be too much because uh, it held seven gallons. If it got down to four and a half, you you were not in good shape, and you just couldn't do the five hours with only burning uh, two and a half gallons of oil. So, so that's why we have to add the oil. So that's so why there's a heavy one the oil intake all inside the cabin. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would have been nice if there was some way of just pumping it in while you were flying, but there wasn't. So. Yeah, the, the Beaver has that. So, uh, well, so Lindbergh did that. He yeah. pumped it in from the cockpit. Did he? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I didn't have to have. I didn't know that. He had to have. Well, but some kind of a gizmo that he... Oh, I didn't know that. that. Yeah. yeah. That's oh. interesting. It was a custom plane. So, uh, now this is... Uh, now we're in 1976, and uh, my boss bought a bunch of uh, uh, commanders, 690s, which is a t just like the one parked down there that they use for photo work uh, with the turbine engines, and those are really nice airplanes that... Uh, you didn't have the same problems as piston airplanes with, uh, uh, you know, all the cold weather problems. And so uh, I got checked out, and so the rest of my flying for this company, Air North, was pretty much, uh, uh, you know, flying in the uh, turbine airplane. And I checked out a new guy in the beach. And about two hours after I checked him out, his engine came apart. And uh, the, the master rod broke on this uh, R985, and the engine failed, and he couldn't feather it because the propeller was no longer connected to the engine. Mm -hmm. And he barely made it back to Fairbanks. And that was just after I checked him out. And, 
and I was then flying the commander, so uh, I got lucky again on that and didn't have a problem with that. So, um, so I flew a Turbo Commander. One of my flights was with all three Alaska congressmen. There was uh, uh, Senator Young, who got killed in a plane crash not too long ago, and uh, Senator Gravel and a, and a Representative Young. And I flew all three of them to Bethel and back one time. And uh, so, so now we're at uh, December 12th, 1976, and George and I are gonna go on vacation down to Southern California. And um, by this time, we figured it, it was enough of Alaska. You know, mm -hmm. it's just, it's, there's no life for a family. You yeah. know, it's just you're constantly flying. And so it was pretty much decided I was really gonna try hard to try to get on with an airline. So by pure luck, we met an airline pilot on our flight down. And he said, you have to get the flight engineer written. You, you won't be able to apply to the airlines unless you pass the flight engineer written exam. And so uh, I tried to get into a class to take this uh, written, and uh, I couldn't get it until the next week. So I called Tommy again, and I said, hey, Tommy, uh, I'd like to stay another week. And he said, oh, we need you back here. I said, well, I really got to stay one more, more, one more week. He said, okay, you're fired. So that was the second time he fired me. After I'd worked for him for, you know, five years, he'd flown 4,000 hours in five years, and, and he just like that, he said, you're fired. And I probably, if I'd gone back up, I would have found a, you know, I, I could have just talked my way out of it, but I was so disgusted at that point, so. So anyway, I got the flight engineer written, and when I came back, I got a, a job with another air service, which was way better, called Wright Air Service, and so. Well, you went back to Alaska? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I only stayed for the next week to take the uh, flight engine. Yeah, Southern Cal. Uh, yeah, I was in Sacramento actually. Oh, okay. uh, and uh, but I took it in LA at LA International. Uh, it was at Continental's uh, headquarters at LA International. But uh, so uh, so now I come back and immediately I got a job with Wright Air Service because he knew he, all the pilots know each other up there and he needed a pilot. And so I got started flying with Wrights and. Uh, this, this is almost the end of it, if everybody's getting tired. <laughs> well, we're, we're having you back next month. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so my first day flying with Wrights is January 25th, 1977. And uh, so, uh, one of my first flights was to a place called Minto. And uh, Fairbanks is here. This is Minto right here. And there's a little, there's a little hill. And the airport is built on the hill. It goes down one side, over the top of the hill, and down the other side. And I flew in there many a time, but the first time was scary because you can't see the other end of the runway. <laughs> and so you, you land, and you really gotta keep the power up because you know, you're know you not gonna have trouble stopping because you're going up this big hill. And the idea is to stop at the top of the hill, and then you can go either, you know, well, you, the wind would be a certain way, so then you would just take off going down the other side of the hill. And I had lots and lots of flights and I really like Wrights because with uh, Air North, there's all these scheduled runs. You kept doing the same things over and over again. All these little places, Eagle, Stevens Village, uh, you know, Beaver, Fort Yukon, Vinatai, uh, Chalkitsik, and but with uh, Wright Air Service, it's all over the you know this whole area here. We flew up here, we flew down here, and all this area here, sometimes over here. So it was really interesting flying, and. Uh, uh, I wrote, just writing down a few interesting flights. Uh, this happened in uh, April 23rd, 1977, a Piper Comanche. Any of you flown Comanches? It's a really nice airplane. It has a 250 horse engine. And uh, so uh, we had just watched the airplane and the flight was to, uh, 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 you know, Denali National Park. And so, uh, I was climbing up to something like seven or eight thousand feet, and I went to, you know, go in level flight, but the the stabilizer was frozen, no. and I couldn't couldn't trim it. And so, the, what had happened is the uh, water from washing the airplane had all frozen, and so so the solution was just to go back down. <laughs> and as soon as we got down to where it was above freezing, then just move the controls a little bit and the. And then it was a normal flight, but so I just mentioned that because it was a kind of a weird little thing, no big deal, just uh, interesting. You you knew right away what was going on. Well, I guess it yeah that's what it was because we had just washed the airplane. Yeah, okay. yeah. So so I still made it. Uh, you know, I just had to go down to and you know get everything freed up. Then I went back up and did the flight. But uh, 
Um, so, now let's see. Now, in all these adventures, you haven't uh, said anything about uh, your laundry bill and your shorts or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. If I, oh, were you ever scared along the way here? Yeah, you? all those ones I just talked about. <laughs> yeah, every one yeah. of them. So uh, now uh, this is some interesting flying. So starting in July, um, they, they, they had just developed infrared cameras back there. This is 1977. And it was a great tool for fires, uh, fire uh, fighting, because uh, you know, an infrared camera, you know, works by, uh, you know, it has a, a, a very cool, it has liquid nitrogen you put in it. Oh. And so the detector can see any 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 kind of heat. Well, you've seen pictures of, you know, taking oh, sure. pictures of people with infrared cameras. And if somebody's smoking a cigarette, you can see it from the air. You can see that little hot cigarette spot would be a little little pinpoint uh, I would think today they don't need the nitrogen they probably got some yeah some different so um, there was a, a woman that uh, uh, I was working with for a long time a couple of months and uh, so she was running the infrared camera and I was doing the flying so uh, we would go over the fires and she would take Polaroid pictures based on her infrared camera and then we would mark the hot spots of the fire where they thought they had gotten it out but it had flared up again and we had all these uh, big cardboard tubes with flags on them and so we took the pictures and you know made a map and she did all this while i was just doing the flying and then we would do a low pass over the fire and drop the tube out the window and then the firefighters could take the films out and they'd know right where to go and so all summer long I did this, and I, I wrote down some notes on it, and uh, 241 hours between uh, July 22nd and September 7th. And I flew uh, up to 150 hours a month doing this infrared camera work all summer long. I was flying, it was in a Cessna uh, 207. So. How many hours a month? 150? Uh, yeah, about 150 hours a month. Just fly eight hours a day, just circling around and around. Wow. And just driving nuts, because you never got to go anyplace. You're just circling. <laughs> um, so I think this is getting to the end here. Uh, so uh, then in December, I, I got a surprise. And I uh, got a call on the phone. I answered. It was United Airlines. And I you know, applied to all the airlines. And, they offered me a job, and this was just before Christmas uh, that they offered me a job. And so my last day at Wright's was. Uh, Are she okay? Do you want any help? No. Oh, it's all over anyway. Now, yeah. uh, I only had one more thing to say. Well, sorry about it. Fire dog, is it a pleasure for you then? Yeah. yeah, yeah, everybody did because all the airplanes were three man. So it took me eight years to make co-pilot. Yeah. It took that long to get through the seniority list. What kind of plane? Uh, it was a Cess uh, 727. Uh, what year was this that you got 1978. hired? 1978. You got hired. So my last flight with Rice was uh, January 18th, and five days later I had my first day of school in Denver. That's the time period when all the Vietnam vets and all were getting hired. And it was mostly civilians in my group. It was, we were all civilians. Wow. Yeah. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have gave up back then. So, <laughs> that's about really it. boring, though. Oh, what was that? It must have been really boring at United after. <laughs> <That's> like, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but it was a nice, stable job. Lots of time off. And, sure. Travel, uh, travel I took a pay cut, a huge pay cut. To, wow. Yeah, I didn't make as much at United till probably uh, three or four years into United. I finally almost made the same amount as I had made up in Alaska. Really? That's surprising. Because yeah, it was hours, you know, flying all those hours, you know, okay. thousand hours a year. So. You so, thought flight engineers was right seat, or, or is there no the side oh, seat? Third, third seat. Yeah. The third side seat. seat. Yeah, you sit sideways. So you're controlling engines and all. Yeah, that engines, stuff. fuel, hydraulics, uh, air conditioning, pressurization. Where were you flying from and to? Oh, all over the country. 
out of San Francisco. San Francisco, yeah. Okay. Yeah, all you're living down here in Santa Clara. Uh, yeah, we've, we've lived there 37 years. Yeah. Where we live now. Yeah. So you go up to San Francisco all the time and then take wherever? Actually, we lived in L.A. for a little while, Huntington Beach, and all, but only two years. And then we came up here in 1980, and I got hired in 78. So we spent our first two years down in the L.A. area, but uh, then we came up here. Did you ever make uh, left seat? Yeah, I spent, uh, I made left seat in 1990, and I retired in 2006. So I had 16 years in the left seat. And so, How many hours do you finally accumulate? Well, including the flight engineer time, about 25,000. Yeah. So, yeah, and I retired in 2006. So, so now I just fly my 180. <laughs> now what's your typical flight in the 180? Uh, so, uh, I do angel flights and uh, young eagle flights. That's about all I do. Huh. It's, uh, it's all young eagle and angel flights. I had a uh, angel flight yesterday flying to uh, Fresno to Oakland, back to Fresno, and back, I got back here at 8 o'clock last night. And on Monday, I went to Reno. To the guy in Reno had cancer, testi testicular cancer, and then the lady yesterday had uh, uh, ovarian cancer. And so they go to treatment, and we just, you know, fly them in to either Palo Alto or Oakland, or you know. So, so that's that's how I fly now. I just, well, that'll be all IFR stuff, right? Yeah, it was IFR yesterday uh, in Fresno. So I keep my IFR current. So. so. But anyway, that that was it, and uh, it was uh, interesting times, and I've never never flown my airplane for the last.